In the next two videos, we're going to look at the effect of unpaired spin, which is to say unpaired electrons, on molecular properties and actually on the ways in which we need to do calculations in order to reproduce relevant properties. So uh, such systems that have unpaired electrons are typically referred to as open shell systems. Now, before I start getting hate mail about using Comic Sans font, I'm just going to point out this is not Comic Sans. Uh, this is, in fact, chalkboard bold. And I'll also point out that in this instance, I did not choose this font, but rather I have, with permission, borrowed a really excellent presentation prepared by my friend and international colleague, Thomas Bali, who's at the University of Fribourg in Switzerland. And so Thomas originally presented this at a winter school in physical organic chemistry, and I'm going to be using his slides for the presentation. And so this was his second lecture at that winter school, but it's our first lecture in open shell species here in computational chemistry. And uh, what is an open shell species? So atom or molecule containing one or more unpaired electrons, and that means that we now have to worry about the spin of the electron. So spin is an intrinsic property of electrons. It's not that they're actually spinning around in any way. Rather, it's named spin because it behaves in a way that has certain analogous uh, behavior compared to spin in a macroscopic system. And in any case, uh, what is known is that electrons have an intrinsic magnetic moment. And we call that the spin. And it's associated with a spin quantum number, s. So for the electron, s is equal to 1 half in atomic units. And in the presence of a magnetic field, and it looks as though all the vector symbols in this presentation are somehow displaced slightly from the letters. So this should be over b. I can't really explain why that happens. But in any case, the spin processes. So here's the spin of the electron, the magnetic moment. And when I turn on a magnetic field, it will again begin precessing about the axis of the field and the z component of the spin will take on quantized values. Okay, and uh, the magnetic quantum number m sub s then is plus or minus a half. We call those alpha or beta electrons, depending on whether the z component is parallel to the spin, sorry, excuse me, is parallel to the field or anti-parallel to the field. So here's the ms equals minus one-half component. Here's the ms equals plus one-half component. It's a convention which sign you choose to take. That's not something we need to worry about here. But this shows the two possible orientations that have quantized sz values. Uh, the magnetic moment itself is proportional but anti-parallel to s. And I don't want to delve too deeply into the various physics here. I'm more interested in the computation side. But uh, that's the relationship between spin and magnetic moment. There is an energy of interaction of the spin with the magnetic field. So a magnetic moment interacts with a magnetic field. And it's the dot product of the two. And the magnetic moment itself is a product of the g value of the electron, the Bohr magneton, which just really carries around, uh, it's a way to convert units, and m sub s, the spin quantum number. All right, so because the electron spin interacts with the magnetic field, the energy levels of the alpha and beta electrons are different, and that's called the Zeeman, actually I suppose I should pronounce it like a German, the Zeeman splitting. And the transitions between these levels uh, can be induced by absorption of electromagnetic radiation, and that's called ESR spectroscopy. So if I have two degenerate levels in the absence of a magnetic field, as I increase the strength of the magnetic field, the coupling between the field and the magnetic moment of the electrons will cause the energy levels associated with the two spin states to split. And at a given magnetic field strength right here, I will find that there is a particular wavelength of radiation that can be absorbed in order to induce a transition between the ms equals minus a half and ms equals plus one half spin states. For a free electron, just uh, floating out there in the vacuum, it turns out that the necessary frequency, it's proportional to the magnetic field strength, and that proportionality is given by uh, 28 megahertz per millitesla of field strength. 
<clears throat> now, if that were all of ESR spectroscopy, that would be pretty dull. You would now know the properties of the electron, and you're done. But what makes it more interesting is that in addition to an external magnetic field, molecules have internal magnetic fields associated with the magnetic moments of nuclei. And so the electron is not merely interacting with the external field, but also with the magnetic moments of the nuclei. And so important nuclei that have magnetic moments include the uh, protonic nucleus, just a proton all by itself in hydrogen, the C13 nucleus, and each of these two nuclei have spins of one half, and uh, they can be parallel or anti-parallel. We usually give that uh, nuclear magnetic moment a subscript I as opposed to a subscript S, which we're using for the electrons. And uh, there too, of course, those uh, magnetic moments can be aligned parallel or anti-parallel to an external field, and when you look at the transition between the magnetic spin states, that's actually called nuclear magnetic resonance spectroscopy. Many of you are quite familiar with NMR spectroscopy. It certainly comes up in uh, introductory organic chemistry courses pretty extensively. And uh, it's really the same principle. We've just focused so far on the electron moment instead of the nuclear moment. So if I allow these moments to interact, one of the things I need to consider is the, the Fermi contact contribution to the interaction. And that is dictated by some sort of a constant associated with the nuclei in question. The magnetic moments of the uh, nucleus, nucleus of the electron and the spin density at the nuclear position. So rho is the electron density, s for spin, zero meaning take the nucleus to be at the origin. So I'm looking at the spin density at the nuclear position because I I want this interaction to occur at the nucleus where its magnetic moment is. So the spin density then is defined as the density of the alpha electrons minus the density of the beta electrons. This is a much smaller interaction typically than that associated with uh, the external magnetic field and so the energy splitting it introduces is called a hyperfine splitting. And here's a way to look at it. So here's the picture we've already seen before. If I have degenerate spin states for an electron, they are lifted as the magnetic field strength increases. But if I think of this as being the level associated just with the free electron, when I introduce an interaction with the magnetic moment of a nucleus, either plus one half or minus one half, I will further split the levels. And I split them down here as well. And that means when I now go and look at electron spin resonance, it turns out it has certain selection rules that you can get from quantum mechanics. And the selection rules are that delta M sub S has to change by plus or minus one. And so that's what we saw originally in the same on splitting. We went from minus a half to plus a half or vice versa. And delta M sub I must be zero. So that means I can transition from an mi equals plus a half state to another mi equals plus a half state, or minus a half to minus a half. So when I consider electromagnetic radiation of a given frequency, and I ask at what field strength will I observe the two electronic spin states to be in resonance with the radiation, it's no longer the unsplit levels. Instead, I'll observe the uh, interaction, sorry, the absorption to take place at this field strength here and this field strength here for plus a half to plus a half and minus a half to minus a half. So I'll see two absorptions. And incidentally, uh, this is in fact the way that an ESR experiment is run. That is, you have a constant radiation frequency and you sweep the strength of your magnetic field. And so that, uh, that just proves to be more convenient technologically than the way we usually think about things, which is sort of a constant field and you're varying your photon uh, wavelength. So when you look at this experiment in the electron spin resonance uh, uh, experiment, you observe an absorption here and an absorption here. And instead of just showing absorption peaks, it turns out by convention, ESR, you usually plot the first derivative of the spectrum, just because you get a little bit more uh, sensitivity and signal to noise out of that. Uh, and so what you see here is a rising peak, and then as uh, you hit uh, 
a, a well it's a first derivative so it goes up 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 and then at some point at the top of the peak the first derivative is zero there's no gradient anymore and then it's a negative slope down 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 so right here is the absorption frequency and there are two of them there's a doublet so the separation between those two defines the hyperfine coupling a sub x associated with nucleus x okay and as we saw before it depends on the spin density and inside this constant are the details about the magnetic moments of the nucleus, the electron, and so on. All right, so we have this interaction. What if we have two equivalent nuclei? So here's my uh, magnetic field strength splitting, and then here's a hyperfine splitting introduced by one nucleus. And now there's a second nucleus that will also introduce a splitting. So I can have a plus a half plus a half for my two nuclei, a plus a half minus a half. Of course, I also uh, split down here. I get minus a half, plus a half, minus a half, minus a half. So this is, uh, if you've done NMR, this looks exactly the same. And I can do the same thing for the lower branch. And now when I consider my radiation uh, and my selection rules, I am going to absorb at three different field strengths and my uh, magnetic resonance experiment, my electron spin resonance experiment, that is, will show this triplet behavior, and it looks just like a triplet in NMR spectroscopy, except that it's the first derivative instead of just being simple absorption peaks. Once again, of course, the separation between the peaks is the hyperfine coupling. And if I have two non-equivalent nuclei, once more, this is looking a lot like NMR spectroscopy. I should see four lines when I consider all the possible selection rules. This is a doublet of doublets, as opposed to a triplet, which you get from equivalent nuclei. So that means there are two different hyperfine splittings, and one can uh, read those right off the spectrum. Okay, well the reason I've introduced all this is I actually want to, to illustrate a phenomenon that most people don't expect until they've seen it for the first time. So let's look at the allyl radical, our good friend from having done Huckel theory calculations. Here is the ESR spectrum of the allyl radical with protons. And you know, it's a pretty rich spectrum. It was measured in 1963 by Fessenden and Schuler. And I'm not going to go through a detailed analysis of this spectrum. I'm going to drop all the lines down and just tell you that when you work it out, you find that you have a doublet of triplet of triplets. And I have all the relevant hyperfine coupling constants here. And so let's remember what the Al radical is. The Al radical, we did, we did it with Huckel theory, and this was the singly occupied molecular orbital, the SOMO of the Al radical. And I've color coded here. Here are two equivalent nuclei by symmetry, and they give rise to a triplet splitting. Here's two equivalent nuclei by symmetry, and they give rise to a triplet splitting. And here's a single uh, nucleus, magnetically active nucleus, and it gives rise to a doublet splitting. And in the absence of having labeled this with C13, uh, you'll only see a 1% natural abundance, so that's not going to show up in the noise of the spectrum. So this is it. This is the entire ESR spectrum. Now, not by just reading this spectrum, but by doing some other experiments, you can actually assign a sign to these hyperfine splittings. So these two are negative, and this one is positive, and we'll come to what that means in a moment. But here's a question for you to puzzle. Remember that the hyperfine splitting depends on the unpaired spin density at the nuclear position. And here I'm showing the singly occupied molecular orbital why is there any spin density on the hydrogen atoms? Because the hydrogen atoms are in the plane. The pi orbital has a node in that plane. There is zero density of that alpha electron in the plane. Even more impressive, there's another nodal plane for this non-bonding orbital in which the red hydrogen atom resides. So it should doubly not have any spin on it, and yet it demonstrably does. So why is there electron spin on the central H atom? There's like two nodal planes there. And the sign of these hyperfine coupling constants being negative, that implies that not only is there spin at those nuclear positions, 
but there is excess beta spin density, where the extra spin is defined to be alpha. So how is it that I have a molecule with an extra alpha electron, and yet there is beta spin density at the blue and purple protonic positions? And so this is one of Thomas Bali's favorite little figures, uh, the guy scratching his head and wondering, could be a gal too, although she's got some hair problems if that's true, uh, wondering what the heck is going on here. And what's going on here is a phenomenon known as spin polarization. So you'll recall from the Pauli principle, uh, a consequence of the Pauli principle is that two electrons of the same spin can never be at the same place at the same time. It's sometimes expressed in other ways, but we'll use this rather simple expression here. And that means if I think of there being an alpha electron just sitting at the origin in space, and I then ask, what's the probability of finding a beta electron? Forget about energy, but just, you know, general probability. Before I let those electrons interact, what's the probability of a beta electron being somewhere in space? Well, it can be anywhere it wants to be. It's got equal probability of being anywhere. Pure statistics. But the probability of another alpha electron being somewhere in space drops to exactly zero at the origin because the Pauli principle dictates that they cannot, in fact, have all the same quantum numbers as the way you'd usually see that written, but they can't be at the same place at the same time. <clears throat> and so we sometimes refer to the Fermi hole that a given electron carries around with it and the Fermi hole is the reduced probability of finding another electron of the same spin near itself. And that phenomenon means that two electrons of the same spin, if you work through the physics, they suffer less repulsion than two electrons of opposite spin because in their correlated motions, it is not possible for them to be in the same place at the same time. And as a result, electrons of opposite spin have a higher propensity to uh, be at opposite regions of space. So let me actually just illustrate that now with a picture. So if I have a planar pi system, and I have an excess alpha electron, and I ask, what does that do in terms of polarization of a sigma bond that's in the plane of that system? Well, I can polarize to have more alpha density near the carbon, or I can polarize to have more beta density near the carbon. And when I have more alpha density there, there's less repulsion between these two electrons because the Fermi hole around either one of them, considering either one to be the reference, means that the other one doesn't get that close to it. So this is more favorable and this is less favorable. And I would observe, as a result, excess negative density on the hydrogen atom at this position. And so if there is spin density on the carbon in a p orbital, I'll find beta density in the bonding orbital and observe a negative hyperfine coupling. That is known as pi sigma spin polarization. Okay, now that explains why we saw negative density on the purple and blue hydrogen atoms. What about positive density on the red hydrogen atom? Well, the next thing to consider is, knowing what I know about alpha and beta electrons and their relative propensity to be near one another, given that the alpha electron occupies, it has amplitude primarily at the one and the three positions and has a node at the two position, well then the beta bonding electron in pi one, let's call this pi two orbital, and there's a pi three that's empty that I'm not showing, in pi one, the beta electron will concentrate more of its amplitude at the central position and less at the outer positions because the alpha electron will enjoy less, because of the Fermi hole, less electrostatic repulsion, and so it concentrates a bit more of its density at the one and three positions and less at the two position. So the shapes of the alpha and beta orbitals are different that means there is excess beta spin at the central carbon. And remember, if there's excess beta spin in the pi system at that carbon, so this whole phenomenon now is pi-pi polarization, but 
now I'll, in, I'll have a pi sigma polarization that will cause there to be positive spin density, that is alpha spin density, at the two position hydrogen. And so I get a positive hyperfine coupling here, and I get negative hyperfine couplings here. So here's a curious feature. This is the part I don't think most people are used to thinking about. Wait a minute. The alpha and the beta electrons, which in principle are paired with one another in pi 1, are actually in different orbitals. So there's no more paired alpha and beta electrons in doubly occupied orbitals. Uh-oh. It's time for the curious guy to show up again. Well, and that's where I'll leave it uh, for this lecture, and we're going to actually look at how this affects computation in a moment, but I will say that that is exactly right. Spin polarization is an observable phenomenon. It does imply that even in things we think of formally as doubly occupied orbitals, there, is, there are not equivalent orbitals for alpha and beta electrons. And in a way, we just have to step back and say, why were we thinking about orbitals in the first place? Really, the observable is the spin density, the electron density. And if I were just to pour a soup of alpha and beta electrons into a sea of nuclei, I'm not sure if you'd never heard of an orbital, you would assume that there might not be places where there's some more alpha than beta and other places where there's more beta than alpha, and that would all just seem okay. Uh, it's only that we are brought up with this sort of Aufbau principle of you know, filling up orbitals that we develop this uh, two electrons in an orbital shape looks exactly the same idea. And it's wrong, so throw that idea from your mind, cast it out, and when you're done doing that, we'll move on to the next video.